Good evening. Hello. On behalf of Holocaust Education Trust Ireland, the Department of History and the Herzog Centre here at Trinity College Dublin, I'd like to welcome you to the 2018 Holocaust Memorial Lecture. Special welcome to Holocaust survivor Tommy Reichenthal. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Zoe Waxman, a Holocaust historian and a pioneer in the study of women in the Holocaust. While questions about gender have been recognized as essential to understanding the human experience, the study of the Holocaust, and particularly the historiography of the Holocaust, has fallen somewhat behind in the attention that it gives to the specific experience of women. Uh, Dr. Waxman's work provides an important contribution to the development of this field of Holocaust studies. She's the author of Writing the Holocaust, Memory, Testimony, Representation, a book on Anne Frank, and Women in the Holocaust, a Feminist History of the Holocaust, as well as numerous articles relating to the Holocaust and genocide. She teaches at the Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies at the University of Oxford. This evening, Dr. Waxman will, give, um, will speak to us on Women in the Holocaust, Lost Stories of the Shoah. Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, I want to begin by thanking you for inviting me to give this lecture. It really is a great honor to be here. Many years ago in Jerusalem, I had the privilege of listening to a Jewish survivor called Ruth Elias recount her terrible story of survival. She became pregnant whilst in the ghetto camp of Theresienstadt, but as her pregnancy was not yet noticeable, she was able to survive selection on arrival at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Later, however, her pregnancy attracted the attention of the infamous German physician, Dr. Joseph Mengele. He allowed her to give birth, but bound her breasts in an experiment to see how long it would take for her baby to survive without nourishment. When Mengele's curiosity was satiated, Elias was told that she and her dying six-day-old daughter were to be sent to the gas chamber. She saved herself and killed her baby by injecting her with morphine obtained from a fellow inmate. She was only 22 years old and not yet ready to die herself. Remarkably, she did survive and went on to make a new life for herself in Israel where she married a fellow survivor. However, it took her many years before she felt able to talk about her experiences. She said that she lied to her children, that when they asked her about the number on her arm, she just told them, so I wouldn't get lost. But it was eventually for her children and also her grandchildren that she decided to speak about her traumatic past. And this is the point I want to make. It seems to me that if Elias and others like her are willing to revisit the past and speak about these terrible times, then it is only right for us to listen to them, to listen to them and to try to recapture the millions, the experiences of all the millions who did not survive. Listening to Ruth Elias was also the moment when I started to think specifically about women's experiences during the Holocaust and how they might have differed to those of men. However, when I started to look at the existing literature on the subject, I found it to be surprisingly sparse. Perhaps unsurprisingly, but no less depressingly, the experiences of men appear to be taken as normative by most historians. Even historians who say they take gender seriously tend to tell the story of the Shoah as though it only affected men. Women, if and when they appear, a bit part players. And although in recent years there has been some very important work done by female scholars, many historians of the Holocaust still seem reluctant to engage with gender as a serious category of analysis. And um, I think you'll find if you open the index to even the most recent texts of the Holocaust, you will probably find an entry for women 
However, you almost certainly won't find an entry for men, for the whole of the book deals with them. Beyond Holocaust history, gender is now an established, indeed a widely respected subfield. Most historians accept that an understanding of gender is essential to understanding human experience. However, for some reason, it remains a blind spot in Holocaust studies, as if looking at gender somehow diminishes the atrocity. What I want to argue is this type of gender myopia not only silences the voices of women, but I would, I would argue skews our very understanding of the Holocaust and stops us from learning more about this terrible period in history. Far from being an undifferentiated or somehow gender neutral attack on the Jewish people, the Holocaust was in its very nature gendered. It affected men and women differently and male and female experiences were different. National socialism, while premised on a monolithic hatred of the Jews, nevertheless saw Jewish women being separate from Jewish men and persecuted them accordingly. In the words of the distinguished historian Raoul Hilberg, the final solution was intended by its creators to ensure the annihilation of all Jews. Yet the road to annihilation was marked by events which specifically affected men as men and women as women. Now, clearly writing gender and especially writing women back into the history of the Holocaust remains an ongoing process and demands further sustained attention. Issues of gender, rape and sexual abuse, women's potential for brutality, the monumental task of rebuilding lives after the war remain under-researched and need to be properly addressed. There is also still much work to be done on men. So far, research on masculinity in the Holocaust has largely restricted itself to the domain of the perpetrators. Yet precisely because it was gendered, the Holocaust was an attack on Jewish masculinity as well as on Jewish femininity. If Jewish women were, above all, feared as mothers, then Jewish men were reviled by the Nazis as fathers. More than this, the events of the Holocaust were experienced by Jewish men as an assault on their gendered identity. They ceased to be able to support their families, to be able to protect them, in the end, many were separated from them. Precisely because gender has been downplayed, this aspect of Holocaust history has been all but ignored. The Nazis identified Jewish men and Jewish women by their sex, renaming them either Israel or Sarah. They then proceeded to treat men and women differently at each stage of their persecution, resulting in gender-specific experiences. Were Jewish men, as the leaders of their communities and potential political opponents, were the first to be targeted for persecution and murder, Jewish women were specifically targeted because of their role as childbearers, as mothers or potential mothers of a future Jewish race. Jewish children were regarded as enemies of the Reich, which meant that being pregnant became a criminal offence. Simply put, for Jewish women, becoming a mother became a violation of Nazi law. Throughout Nazi Germany, desperate Jewish women were forced to seek out illegal abortions. Then in 1938, abortion was made legal for Jewish women. No more Jewish children were to be born. And before long, all Jewish children were to be murdered. Approximately a million to a million and a half Jewish children under the age of 16 lost their lives during the Shoah. In order to understand how the Jews responded to the destruction they were forced to endure and to appreciate the heterogeneity of the victims of the Holocaust, we need to understand the various factors which influence the response, the various factors that influence their being. This is not, and I want to make this point very strongly, this is not, of course, limited to gender. Social, cultural, economic, and political differences all had an impact on the experiences of the Jews during the Holocaust. 
as did age and familial circumstances. The, Jew, the Jewish victims cannot be treated as a homogenous entity. Some were religious, some secular, some Zionist, communist, or politically uninterested. While some Jews were poor and lived in small villages, others were more prosperous and lived in major cities. Nevertheless, overlying and underpinning these distinctions, gender was inescapable and became even more important as the catastrophe went on. All Jews, regardless of who they were, were intended to die. Both men and women were forced to endure the acute deprivations and degradation of the ghetto, the uncertainties of life in hiding, and the appalling suffering of the concentration and death camps. They were also powerless to stop the anguish of their loved ones, their children, their husbands, their wives, their parents, and ultimately were forced to accept their almost inevitable deaths, whether in the disease-ridden ghettos of Eastern Europe, the killing fields of Belarus, Ukraine, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania and Yugoslavia, or the gas chambers of places such as Auschwitz-Birkenau, Hromno, Belzig, Sobibor and Treblinka in the Majdanek. Approximately six million Jews, two-thirds of European Jewry and one-third of the world's Jewish population at the time were murdered. So in a very real sense, gender became all but irrelevant under the Nazis' escalating and relentless policy of mass murder, as men, women and children were all condemned to the same brutal fate. However, in another very important sense, gender became more important, more, and cru more crucial, and this is the story I want to tell. In Germany, the first mass arrest of Jews following Kristallnacht on 9th, 10th November 1938, was exclusively focused on men. As Jewish men were presumed to constitute the greatest threat, they were initially more likely to be arrested and imprisoned. Jewish men, especially the Haredi, or the so-called ultra-Orthodox, with their beards, side locks, and traditional clothing, were especially easily identifiable. As a result, Around 30,000 Jewish men were arrested throughout Germany and deported to concentration camps at Dachau, Sachsenhausen, and Buchenwald, leaving their women and children to face the worsening situation in Germany alone. This gendered attack intensified and spread after the invasion of Poland. In the ghettos of Eastern Europe, the Nazis also clearly distinguished between men and women. Haredi men suffered some of the first attempts at public humiliation during the so-called beard actions, where their facial hair was publicly and painfully shaved off. They were also murdered as part of a systematic targeting of community leaders. Rao Hilberg used ghetto statistics and the records of the death, SS death squads to show that in the early years of the war, more men than women were killed. This resulted in what Hilberg has called a newly isolated community consisting of men without power and women without support. In the initial stages of the German invasion, there was a widespread belief that it was only men that were in real danger. Many could not believe or could not allow themselves to believe that the Germans would harm women and children. Indeed, small children were at least initially given special food rations. Men were therefore encouraged to escape to Soviet-occupied eastern Poland. And some Jewish men also responded to the plea made by the Polish government at the outbreak of the war for all young, able-bodied men to join the Polish army. Those that did were either killed in battle or captured in, and interned in German prisoner of war camps. In contrast, few women fled, um, not only because they believed they were in no immediate danger, but because more often than not, there were seldom enough financial resources to allow whole families to escape, and women were more likely to take responsibility for elderly parents and children. They had to stay behind to look after them. Women, therefore, outnumbered men in the ghettos. 
Hundreds of ghettos were created throughout German-occupied Eastern Europe, beginning in December 1939 and culminating with the liquidation of the Lodz ghetto in 1944. Not only was ghettoization a significant stage in the persecution and murder of the Jews as a race, but it also marked a further breakdown in the Jewish family. In November 1941, the Jewish social historian Emanuel Ringelblum recorded that in the Warsaw Ghetto, he wrote at the time, women pregnant up to three months have to have an abortion. In the Vilna Ghetto, the Gestapo informed the Jewish council that no more Jewish children are to be born, adding that the order came from Berlin. And in 1942, in the Kovno Ghetto, women were forced to undergo compulsory abortions if found to be pregnant. A gynecologist in the ghetto, in the Kovno Ghetto, wrote, quote, unwittingly, they would reach advanced stages of pregnancy. By an order of July 1942, Pregnancy in the ghetto was punishable with death to the father, the mother, and the infant. We had to start making abortion by the hundreds. Yet there were many women who refused, to, who refused abortions for all the danger it involved, and with great courage awaited the day of giving birth. For observant Jews, the decision to abort their fetuses was particularly difficult. In Jewish law, the greatest value is given to the preservation of life. However, when the life of an unborn child threatens the life of the mother, Jewish law dictates that the latter be given preference and allows for abortion in certain cases. In Kovno, rabbis actually stated that as a result of a Nazi decree, abortion was permissible without any medical indications. Nevertheless, for women, who at other times would have been joyful at the prospect of motherhood, the necessity to abort their child was, never, was needless to say, devastating. One young woman, a 22-year-old Polish Jew, worked in the Warsaw Children's Hospital and was about to qualify as a doctor when the war broke out. And she discovered that she was pregnant whilst in hiding. She found a doctor who performed an abortion for a large amount of money. She was from a well-off family, so she was able to provide this money. And she describes how she, quote, had to take three other young girls for the same operation, each of whom might, as a consequence, never be able to have children, especially as I couldn't guarantee them anything except the operation itself. There were no facilities for convalescence, but that was the way it had to be, because who knew better than I that children had no right to be born. Despite the prohibition on childbearing, many women did continue to get pregnant in the ghettos. And as we have heard, some women made the very risky decision to carry their babies to term. It was hard to give up on a dream of a new life, of a future. For others, particularly those who had lost family members, the desire for remembrance was strong. One woman who became pregnant in the Warsaw Ghetto exclaimed, when I see the destruction around us, I feel I want to have as many children as I can. At the same time, she was terrified that any child she gave birth to would likely starve to death. Articulating her dilemma, she asked, but if I do anything to prevent it being born, won't I be playing into Hitler's hands? Wasn't this precisely what he wanted to achieve, to destroy our race? Would I not be doing his work for him? After all, if the war ended soon, there would be one new life already to compensate for those who have died. She miscarried shortly after. Despite the fact that they were ultimately unable to save their families, both men and women desperately tried to appease their suffering whilst they could. Women, for example, tried to feed their families in the face of dwindling provisions. They also took over the task of standing for hours in dangerous food queues, as well as the procurement of employment and the ordeal of negotiating with both the Jewish and German authorities for the return of property or immunity from deportation, as it was widely, if wrongly, assumed 
that men were more likely be, to be deported to forced labour. Not only were they on occasion beaten for their efforts, but women were also to find out that they were increasingly not immune from the threat of forced labour. Particularly following the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, not just men, but women and children were soon targeted and murdered. During the last days of the ghettos, when Jews were left, when few Jews were left, and deportation to the concentration and death camps became increasingly inevitable, the plight of women and children became ever more desperate. During the mass deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto in the summer of 1942, which resulted in around 265,000 Jews being herded into sealed and overcrowded cattle trunks and set to the Treblinka death camp. Abraham Lewin, a man in the Warsaw Ghetto, observed that women who were seized yesterday were freed if they sacrificed their children. To our pain and sorrow, many women save themselves this way. And that's a discussion for another time, his words. In their anguish, some mothers left children on the doorsteps of non-Jewish homes and Christian institutions in the hope that someone would save their child. Other women threw their babies out of the cattle trucks on the way to the camps. And this included some women who actually gave birth in the trucks on the way to the camps. And men too, of course, struggled to protect their families. 27-year-old Kala Perichodnik in, in a ghetto near Warsaw joined the ghetto police in the hope that his position would protect his wife and their two-year-old daughter from deportation. In a diary written whilst in hiding, he stated, seeing that the war was not coming to an end and in order to be free from the roundup of the labor camp, I entered the ranks of the ghetto police. It was, he soon discovered, only a temporary stay of execution. He was later to find his family amongst 8,000 Jews being forced into cattle trucks and deported to Treblinka. As the threat of deportation grew ever greater, so the temptation of fleeing became harder to resist. Yet in deciding to escape, Jews faced new and terrible dilemmas. Forced to flee for their lives, families had to decide whether to try to stay together or to go into hiding separately and hope against all odds to be reunited after the war. Married couples in hiding were not only usually forced to separate, but could very rarely keep children under the age of 16 with them. Yanina David, an only child, was just 13 years old when she was forced to leave her parents in the Warsaw Ghetto. She was sheltered by a Polish woman and her German-born husband on the Aryan side, where she witnessed the destruction of the ghetto from her hiding place. She remembers, I sat in the back bedroom, staring hypnotically at the column of smoke, trying to imagine what my parents were doing. What had happened to mother? Was she crouching somewhere in a cellar as we did during those 48 hours before I left them? Was she trembling and crying alone crowded among strangers, waiting for that final explosion. My heart turned over in misery. I had no right to leave her. My place was there. Even though I could not help or protect her, at least there would have been two of us together. While she longed to return to her mother, her own hiding place became too dangerous, and the family protecting her arranged for her to be moved to a Catholic convent where she survived the war under a false name. Um, and although she survived, she was constantly terrified that her true identity would be discovered, and her parents did not survive. Unlike Anne Frank and her family, hiding together in an attic with the help of Gentile friends, most Jews did not literally hide themselves away, but instead attempted to live the life of normal citizens by passing as Aryan, some alone and some with family members. Some acquired forged documents and moved from place to place, both in cities and small villages, hiding in convents and monasteries and factories, and sometimes passing as non-Jews in concentration camps and forced labor camps. Many of those who fled, at times perhaps even a majority, were women. 
women possessed advantages that their men folk did not. Some were better used to dealing with the Gentile world than their religious husbands, and they lacked the distinguishing feature, circumcision, which marked out most male Jews, religious or not. In Warsaw, where it is thought that more Jews went into hiding than in any other European city, it is estimated that about two-thirds of Jews in hiding on the Aryan side were women. <coughs> Writing on the predominance of women amongst those who lived in open hiding in Poland, the scholar Lenore Weizmann has noted that it may be explained, at least in part, by the fact that women were more likely to believe that they could pass initially and were more self-confident when they embarked on their new, new lives. Men, by contrast, she says, were more reluctant to try. And she compares being circumcised to other distinguishing physical or social characteristics, such as dark hair or a prominent nose or a distinctive accent. In addition to stereotypically Jewish features, the markings of emotional and physical suffering and a lack of financial resources limited men's and women's abilities to pass as Aryan. Women's social and economic status, education, work experience, linguistic ability, and religious background also either facilitated or hindered the ability to pass. The country in which they were trying to pass, however, was probably most important. In Poland, and particularly in Warsaw, Jewish women had achieved considerable cultural assimilation. Prior to the war, Jewish girls were more likely than Jewish boys to attend non-Jewish schools, which provided them with knowledge and contacts that helped them to pass. And they were also um, more likely to have the ability to speak colloquial Polish and to be familiar with Polish and in particular Catholic customs. It is very important that we emphasize that escape through hiding did not mean liberation, much less salvation. Women in hiding, especially Jewish women in hiding, were doubly vulnerable. They were vulnerable, of course, because they were Jews. They were subject to the Nazi racial laws. Indeed, their very existence was an affront to the Nazi genocidal state. They were also victims of an anti-Semitic society. Although some non-Jews were sympathetic, many more were only too pleased to receive a reward for um, handing them over to the authorities, and others actively conspired in their extermination. These women were also, however, especially vulnerable precisely because they were women. Those who were mothers or who had assumed a conventional caring role for families or friends and who lacked the support of a male figure had to assume an intolerable burden. Most of these women who lived in what might be called open hiding also had to bear the agony of being separated from their children. All women, whether old or young, married or single, were also at the mercy of men. The sexual abuse and exploitation of women by the invaders, the Aryan indigenous population, and even by other Jews was never systematic, as I've shown in my research, but it was widespread. Even more than in the ghettos, hiding made family life all but impossible. Indeed, it made families more exposed to danger than individuals. Unable to protect their families, Jewish men experienced a powerful sense of impotence and failure to fulfill their gendered role as protectors and patriarchs. Um, the diary of Leon Kliniki Klonimus, written in pencil in Hebrew, and covering 90 small notebooks, describes this process in unremitting detail. He writes of his desperation to save his three-month-old son, Adam, and keep his family together. Kanikia teacher, together with his wife, Malvina, also a teacher, and young baby, fled eastern Galicia, a small village in East Galicia, moving from one village to another in a futile attempt to find a safe hiding space. They lacked food, clothing, and money. Everything was against them. The diary, his diary, covers just a fortnight of this desperate plight. The first diary entry records, 
A Jew is no longer able to remain alive. Whenever a Jew is met anywhere, he is taken to be killed. They look for Jews everywhere, in the hideouts, at the homes of Christian families, and in the fields. In order to escape the Germans, where Jews were forced to hide in increasingly desperate places, for example, cellars and underground sewers. And at one stage, hiding in a cellar with his son, Pliniki writes, I had some heated encounters with fellow Jews who were hiding. They demanded that I allow the strangling of my child. Among them were mothers whose children had already met this fate. Of course I replied to them that as long as I was alive, I would allow no such thing to come to pass. Women, who were often surviving without their husbands, found their role as mother just as hard to fulfill. Indeed, the very fact that they were mothers made their survival more difficult. Women with small children were often prevented from accessing hiding places, as children were such an obvious liability. Eugenia Weinberg actually gave birth to a baby in a sewer in the Polish city of Lwów. All she had at her disposal was a pair of rusty scissors and a towel. Although he was born alive, the mother knew it would be impossible to care for her baby under such dire conditions. She was therefore faced with the dilemma of attempting to keep the child alive at all costs or to sacrifice its life for the sake of her fellow Jews in hiding for its cries would, of course, alert people to their presence in the streets above. It is difficult to know exactly what happened, but it appears the baby's life was sacrificed for the safety of the group. Kroniki and his wife, however, left their hiding place. Desperately trying to find more help, he describes how one of the few Christians willing to assist the family, their former maid, Frank, their former maid Franca, was prevented to do it by... Do from doing so by fear. He writes, she is afraid. Posters have been placed throughout town announcing the death penalty for anyone hiding Jews. This is the reason for our being out in the field rather than at our home. And he also bemoaned the fact that he had had his son Adam circumcised. He writes, what a pity that I gave in to my zealously devout father-in-law and allowed my son to undergo a circumcision. Had he remained uncircumcised, there would have been no difficulty in finding a peasant to look after him till the war's end, but now they are afraid to do so. They were actually finally able to find a convent that agreed to take their son. It is thought that Dorea and Malvina were murdered by the Germans in a forest sometime in January 1944. His notebooks were found buried in the ground, together with a letter that Malvina had written her relatives in America, but never got to send. She writes in the letter, I want so much to bring up my adored son, to get pleasure from him. Is it possible? It is even difficult to dream about. We've still not been able to discover what happened to the little boy. Like so many other Jewish children, his fate remains unknown. So the story of this family is in other respects exceptional, of course. For one, it was written down and the testimony preserved. They were a family and in the end, a married couple who tried to stay together. For most Jewish women, there was no husband, often no companion, they were alone. Whilst their gender might have given them some hope of escape, it also condemned them to a life of insecurity, fear, and frequent discovery. For the majority of Jews were captured in the end. Some were rounded up and shot, and others were deported to the concentration and death camps. Tracing the history of those deported to the death camps, much less determining the continued experience of gender on their lives, and indeed deaths, is made difficult by the lack of evidence. Testimony from Treblinka, as well as other death camps at Chelmno, Pelzek, and Sobobor, is extremely rare, as very few prisoners survived, and most of the document documentation was destroyed by the Nazis. It is not, however, impossible to uncover some of what happened. K. 
careful sifting of the evidence and the testimony of those in other camps, not least the enormous Auschwitz-Birkenau complex, which combined aspects of a concentration and death camp, enables us to see that even in the extremity of the extermination process, gender was still present, still real, and still formative of men's, women's, and children's lives. On arrival at the concentration camps, women were far less likely to survive the initial selection. Not only were men separated from women, but women accompanied by children under the age of 14 were sent straight to their deaths. Gender operated as a crucial signifier between life and death. The commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hoss, wrote in his memoir that he wanted to avoid the commotion that would have resulted from children being separated from their mothers. Describing how children often entered the gas chambers with a toy in their hands, he writes that, I noticed that women who had either guessed or knew what awaited them, nevertheless found the courage to joke with their children, to encourage them despite the mortal terror visible in their own eyes. Any woman who is visibly pregnant would also be sent straight to the gas chambers. Thus, the fate of women was inextricably bound to that of their children. In that sense, in the purely empirical sense, gender became a matter of life and death. And as Gerda Weissmann Klein writes, I had learned to associate children with death. Nor did women without children cease to feel the effects of their gender, the consequences of being a Jewish woman. Women who survived the initiation process were subject to exploitation from the moment they set foot in the camps. Beginning with a painful search of the most vulnerable parts of their bodies and followed by the brutal shaving of their hair, women experienced a, vital, a violent assault that robbed them of their identity and sense of self. The very qualities which had made them women were manipulated and exploited by the Nazis as a source of dehumanization. The religious Jewish women who once married must refrain from displaying their hair in public. The sense of loss was particularly acute. Finally, the replacement of their names by tattooed serial numbers told them that there could be no return to their pre-war lives. They were now subject to the whims of anyone who had more power over them, from the SS guards to the miserable prisoners in charge of the soup cauldrons. This made women, and particularly young women, especially vulnerable to rape and sexual abuse. And um, most women carried with them this awareness even if they did not experience it themselves. In the camps, women's experiences, their treatment by concentration camp guards, their relationships with other prisoners, and even their very chances of survival were different to those of men. Before the war, conditions for men were much worse than they were for female concentration camp inmates. They experienced both far higher levels of brutality and were subjected to particularly gruelling physical labour. However, by early 1939, the first camp for women was in operation at Ravensbrück, and by spring 1942, a women's camp was opened in Auschwitz-Birkenau to relieve the overcrowding at Ravensbrück. It was clearly understood that imprisoning women was different to imprisoning men, and officials from Ravensbrück travelled to Auschwitz to oversee the development of a new camp. Between the inception of the camp until mid-August 1942, approximately 17,000 women, mostly Jewish, were brought to Auschwitz. And conditions were far worse in the women's camp, as women were not considered to be capable of hard labor for any sustained period. Their barracks, which were built on swamp land without any insulation, were freezing in winter and oppressively hot in summer. As well as lice and fleas, women were plagued by rats which attacked them as they grew weaker. A couple of buckets served as sanitary facilities for an entire barracks. The SS women and the female prisoners who headed the work commanders roared the prisoners with a brutality that matched their male counterparts. 
women had to be prepared to fight from everything, for everything, from access to the latrine, to space in a bunk, to a place in a supposedly easier work crew, to the revolting and pitiful food rations. The prisoners were constantly hungry. Ogilengio writes that the soup the prisoners were so desperate to get hold of contain, contained ingredients such as buttons, keys, tufts of hair and dead mice. Women prisoners, as a result, were less likely to survive than those enduring the male camps. Of course, and I want to go back to this point, every Jew, male or female, was ultimately condemned to death. However, the hellish world of Auschwitz proves beyond all doubt that for Jewish women, the racism and sexism of the Nazis cast them in a particularly vulnerable position. It was sometimes the case that pregnant women were admitted into the camp, either because they were married to Gentile husbands or because their pregnancy was not yet noticeable. However, they were encouraged to come forward with the promises of better food or living conditions. And these women were usually sent to the gas chambers or even thrown into the crematory ovens still alive. One woman describes what happened when a fellow prisoner's pregnancy continued undetected. The woman somehow managed to conceal her condition by bandaging her stomach with torn up rags. And she actually gave birth to a live baby, but bled profusely and both died shortly after. It is unclear from this account whether the mother and baby were left to die alone or were murdered when an SS man discovered them. And pregnant women were specifically targeted for medical experimentation. Dr. Mengele was especially intrigued by pregnancy and birth and liked to and supervise a woman until she had given birth and then send both mother and baby to the gas chambers. He was also interested as the terrible story of Ruth Elias that I started the lecture with shows in how long a newborn baby could survive without nourishment. Women who did manage to successfully conceal their pregnancies and give birth undiscovered were forced to engage in back-breaking hard physical labor, both up to the moment of birth and immediately after. Babies were delivered without, with unsterilized instruments and nothing to cut the umbilical cord. New mothers were unable to feed their babies as malnutrition meant that they had little or no milk. It is not known how many babies were born in the camp as there were no separate registers for children. If a baby was deemed to be suitable for Germanization, for example, if they were um, blonde haired and blue eyed, they were quickly sent to, separated from the mother and um, relocated to Germany. Any children that survived received their concentration camp numbers, usually on their thighs or buttocks, but sometimes on their arms. And Auschwitz was entered as the place of birth. It also appears that by 1944, Jewish babies were not murdered immediately after birth, as the birth and serial numbers of eight Jewish babies were recorded that year. However, it is most likely that they ended up being gassed along with their mothers or even burned alive in the crematoria. As part of the genocidal intent to destroy their reproductive capacity, racially inferior and Jewish and Roma and Sinti women and men were also subjected to Nazi medical experiments in mass sterilization. Not deemed to be human, these women and men became experimental subjects or even objects, nothing more than living specimens on which to work. Liberation ended this, of course, but oddly, importantly, it did not erase differences of gender. Even for those who had somehow managed to survive the Nazi genocide, whether in hiding or in concentration camps, the importance of gender cannot be overstated. Precisely because of their experiences, experiences which were dictated by their gender, many female survivors have found it particularly hard to rebuild their lives after the war. More than that, as the Holocaust scholar Renit Lentin has argued, not only did survivors find it hard to tell, in many cases, there was no one listening. Many experiences particular to women, such as rape, fear of rape, abortion, sterilization, childbirth, infanticide, 
and the murder of their children are especially difficult to hear about. However, I believe that it is our duty to listen to these women, to listen and to ask questions. Without asking questions, even if they are hard questions, even one might say if they turn out to be the wrong questions, we will never come closer to a fuller picture of women's experiences under Nazism. This means turning again to the testimonies of the victims, which were sometimes fragmentary, offer multiple accounts of gendered experience. Well, testimonies can never be representative of Holocaust experiences, for the vast majority of victims perished without ever writing down their experiences. They nevertheless help us learn more about the life of the victims and emphasize the individuality of lived experience. They remind us of the wide range of different experiences, not just between men and women, but even between prisoners within the same concentration camp. Revealing the multiple identities of the victims based on such factors as ethnicity, social and economic class, marital status, nationality, religiosity, and political leaning forces us to resist simplistic gendered stereotypes and shows instead how gender needs to be understood in conjunction with other analytical categories. Reading the testimonies and listening to the voices of the victims of the Holocaust, both those who perished and those who somehow managed to survive, demonstrates the remarkable resilience of gendered categories, even at moments in which the life of these Jewish victims was almost unrecognizable just as the Nazis intended them to be. That the Holocaust was an appalling event of almost unimaginable suffering for all involved in its wake should be self-evident. As Joan Ringelheim has written, every Jew, regardless of gender, was equally a victim of the Holocaust. So a focus on women does not deny the experiences of the male victims of Nazism, but rather allows us more to look more closely at what had happened to women as women and men as men. In order to avoid a monolithic view of Jews and Jewish victims of Nazism, we need to understand the gendered nature, both of their victimhood and of their sense of self, as well as the pivotal role that gender played during the Holocaust. Only by doing so can we learn more about those who survived and those who did not survive. I'm concluding, you'll be relieved to hear. Historians are rightly wary of politicizing the history they write, fearing the distorting of effects of an explicit agenda. Yet, I think, there comes a moment when scholars must come clean and admit they are motivated not merely by a disinterested search for truth. It is my hope that trying to recapture something of the lives and deaths of the female victims of the Holocaust might provoke action as well as sadness, hope as well as despair. The age of genocide is not over, nor are the brutal discriminatory ideas about women which give genocide much of its power and ensure that it is women and children who are most often its victims. We owe it to them to challenge the deep-rooted ideologies, the underlying patriarchal assumptions, the violent, murderous sexism which was manifested in the Holocaust and can be seen at work today. My work, of course, isn't going to change any of this, but I do hope it will help people rethink the history of the Holocaust and the history of women. And in this sense, it will be my contribution to a broader process of remembering and honouring women's experiences in the past and help improving women's lives now and in the future. Thank you.